class five of eight. Let me just pull up um, the chat button just to make sure. Julie, you'll watch chat a little bit. Um, this theme is around kids and wheels. So we're going to, most of the content has got to do with how to expose and socialize your dog properly to those um, two common things that normally dogs can have a reaction to. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Yoram Indiris. I'm the owner and founder of Canine Learning Academy. And this here is... I'm Julie Fryman. I'm one of the managers and the head dog trainer here at Canine Learning Academy. And we, together, we help edit, produce, create, mastermind the uh, online group classes together. So we are creating those all just all between <laughs> us. Um, we don't have any, you know, pro professional editing, um, although Yo is becoming that <laughs> throughout this process. So... Um, we're excited to have you guys here. Please be patient with the recordings and the follow-up emails just because we are doing so many things right now, but we want to get the information out to you. So a little bit about your class rules. Today's class is instructional, so you don't need, you can let your puppies rest and get some sleep. It's a humans only class, but Thursday's class is where you can invite your puppy and practice hands-on in front of us so that we can give you um, really good specific feedback we can see and hear you. So if you don't want us to see you in your pajamas or something, you can always turn your video off. If you've got to run, you've got an appointment or something, no problem, because if you're registered, you'll get a link later on to the recording of this class. I highly recommend if there's someone else in your family that's participating in the training process, um, you should send them that link and say, hey, watch this on your own time, just so that you guys are all on the same page. I can't tell you how many times, you know, the husband wants to do it this way, the wife wants to do it this way, and the kids are just like, I don't know. And the poor puppy is running around so confused, he doesn't know who to listen to, so. The Puppy Start Right class is gonna follow the Puppy Start Right preschool curriculum. It's a curriculum that we actually use in a group class, um, but we've had much more success doing it here virtually online because you, the human, is actually doing the work. So you're learning that hands-on process um, that a lot of other people don't, don't get to pick up. Here's a little overview of what the course is like. It runs for four weeks, two classes every week. We talk about the canine development, what stages are the dog is at so that you understand to be a little sensitive if your dog is going through a maturity um, stage. You're gonna learn body language, socialization. We've got a couple of things that we're gonna show you specifically, step one, step two, step three, and how to expose your dog properly or positively to a particular object. Um, we're gonna teach you how to prevent all and every single unwanted behavior, barking, chewing, lunging, um, pulling on leash, and all of that resource guarding. Um, we have a really awesome business model that we are going to share with you, and we're gonna go through two topics. Enrichment, physically and mentally enriching your dog's life and foundation training, specifically today, wheels and children. So a little bit about, um, I guess we're going to, we, we do have some loose leash walking, right? And pet. We have pet. Yeah. I don't think we have I did add it. Okay. We're going to teach you how to play tug of war. And we're going to teach you a lot about the toys. So those of you that are having problems with your dog biting, we're going to start introducing some toys. Um, going into development, developmental stages, there's typically eight different stages. And today specifically, we're going to talk about the adolescent stage. So just really quick, if you could type in the chat, whose dog is around that six, seven, eight month mark, maybe five, between five and seven months right now. Um, if you could just type in the chat, that's us or exactly how old your puppy is. Um, I want to kind of see how many people are in this very, very tough period. Um, my dog's around nine weeks now. So if you have- I only think we have a couple dogs. That maybe, are in the five, yeah. six, seven month range. Okay. Oh, perfect. Five and a half, five and a half nice. months. So your puppy is starting to really enter into this adolescent stage. What we would call it in uh, human kids is teen. puberty. We would call them teenagers. So this can be a difficult stage if you're not prepared. Yeah. It's like when a, when a young girl finally gets her first cycle, right? Right. 
Um, if you don't know what to do, you're going to panic and everything's going to, it's going to be a little crazy in that moment. And what are some of the things that you'll notice that is different during that stage? So physiologically, they're, they're getting those final adult teeth in the molars, just like our wisdom teeth grow in when we're around the teenage age, they're gaining muscle and filling out. This is the time when your puppy starts looking like a dog and it can sometimes be hard for us puppy owners but this is when they really start to develop into the young adult that they're going to be um, increased hormone levels so you're going to notice a dramatic teenager running away <laughs> and oh, and Bentley sometimes rolls his eyes a little bit so you know we have these personalities that we identify really easily in humans but then our dogs start going crazy and we just think that they're why being, aren't they listening anymore yeah, they're being so mean they're not the puppy i wanted and you know it's it's a difficult stage so this is also when girls reach sexual maturity they're starting to be able to have their first litter they shouldn't be bred under a year but that's up to your breeder um, and the boys begin actively searching for mates around this time. So always, always, always keeping your dog supervised and on leash, especially when outside to prevent um, running away. So management is the key to stopping any unwanted behaviors. And if you are not quite sure, even though we keep beating it up, you're not quite sure what exactly that means and you're struggling with a dog that's in this stage, um, hit us up. We would like to offer you a 30 minute private consultation so we that can help you kind of get through that process because it's really stressful for everyone. It's stressful to kind of all of a sudden lose your dog for a little bit. You know, all the good, you know, following you all of a sudden they become like their own independent dog and they're more curious about everything else. So we'll help you fix that through bonding and understanding why the problem's happening, happening and how to prevent it. All right, so playtime with toys, the category of toys. We use toys for a lot of different reasons. So there are, I'd say four or five different categories. So write this down. Category one, you've got the toys that your dog is going to use to chew. So just put toys dot one, toys for chew. Two, interactive toys. Three, training toys. And four, comforting toys. Did I miss one? I think that's I think it. That's okay. It. All right. So um, as I play this video, I'm going to kind of talk over it. You do want to have a, well, here the treat dispensary toys is basically like the enrichment. It helps your dog mentally strategize, gives them problem solving skills. It helps them explore an area of your house or crate that you'd like to um, make more interesting. An interactive toy, usually like a rope or something that's got a string on it, is how you're going to train your dog drop, take, get. So we call these interactive or training toys. They usually have a squeaker, a rope, a ball. So that's where you're going to teach the fetch, the take, the drop. So that's how we use, and we're going to be demonstrating that today. So cute. The self-amusement toy are basically the chew toys. Now, there's two kinds of chew toys. There's the type of chew toys that you feel 100% safe that your puppy can be left alone, right? And that's like your Kongs, right? They're made out of rubber. They get your dog going, and then they just feel really good on their teeth. And the other type of chew toys are the ones that have to be supervised. So this toy that I just showed here on this video, it's really... Let's see, this one right here, it's awesome. Dogs usually just absolutely love that. The antler, the bully sticks, right? Those are your go-to chew toys. However, left alone can be dangerous. But if you need some time just away from your dog, you want to watch a movie or you've got something to do or you're working from home, um, those, kind of, those kind of chew toys help give your dogs and teach your dog some independence. Placing a chew toy that's um, a placing a chew toy that's helps get them through a crate. It's also how dogs let out stress and explore the world. So if they're not properly able to toys. use their mouth every day on something that we've specifically provided for them, 
they will use their mouth on you or on your things or on the wood or I, you know, my puppy pulled up the wood paneling on the floor. Um, they will find something to chew on if you are not teaching them what you would rather them do. The comfort toys is something that you can put in your dog's crate or bed when they're not like when they're when they're ready to relax and go to sleep. I wouldn't put a stuffed animal with the eyeballs and stuff in a dog's crate when they're just waking up in the morning. But at night, it seems to be where they're not going to mess with it. Um, also, not leaving them completely alone in the house with a stuffed animal. So that's your comfort toys. A lot of puppies enjoy that at night, especially their first couple days being away from the litter. You do want to make sure you have a place to store and put all your toys away so that when you bring one out, there's a purpose and it creates a drive and a desire for your dog to use the toy. You last thing you want to do is leave everything on the floor and have your dog entertain themselves. The dog, the dog's pup, the dog's toys become no meaning anymore and they lose the value that you could actually use for training and just managing. Right. And your puppies don't naturally know how to play with every toy. So if you just set all their toys out on the ground and you're like, okay, bud, go for it. They may look at you like, I don't, I haven't been taught how to use this, but I know how to bite your feet. <laughs> so that makes the same squeaky yeah. noise, right? So making sure they know how to use the toys before you just assume, oh, you can play with this by yourself. So we're gonna show, uh, teach it, we're gonna teach Drop It. Is anyone currently using the cue called Drop It? Before we uh, show the video, we're gonna just go over and talk through it. So the goal for Drop It is that whatever is already in the mouth, can you that? Um, the dog is to open their mouth and remove it, right? They're supposed to drop what's ever in the mouth, just for you. Oh, all right. We've got a question. Foster probably a year or more. Okay. That's okay. We've got that. Um, the importance of teaching a drop it is if you're not managing and your dog accidentally picks up your slipper or something that's dangerous, you want them to quickly be able to open their mouth um, on the beach. So you guys are using drop it. Mm -hmm. Is it effective? Does your dog listen to it every single time or is it every once in a while? My point is you want to teach drop it with things that are not necessarily dangerous. You want to teach drop it in a game where your dog enjoys dropping it because something else is going to come instead. We're getting a lot of good comments. Good. A little bit. All right. So before we, we like to teach the behavior first and then put the cue on it. So the dog goes, okay, I know that word. And so we're going to go over all the steps and the steps. I'm going to just talk to you first, and then we're going to go through it in video. We want to offer an item to your dog that your dog likes, and they begin play. Once they've got it in their mouth, that's the step one, right? Now we can teach the drop. And the drop is really simple, is that we have to go, we have to one up it, right? We have to offer a treat or a different toy and make that toy super interesting in order for your dog to go, I want that instead, right? That's it. We do the same thing with babies that are in our arms. Once they grab our hair, our earrings, what do we do? We grab, oh my gosh, look at this. And then we give them something like that so we can <laughs> remove the object that they have their death grip on. So we do the same thing, distract, replace, remove to create that, oh, this is what I would rather have you have. So Thursday's class, you're going to be asked to teach drop it right in front of us. You're going to bring two toys. Once your dog has engaged in play or a game of tug of war, you're going to present the other object or a treat over their nose. And the moment that their mouth opens, you're going to mark. So if you've got your clicker, that's when that mark happens is when the mouth is open. And then you're going to first give the toy or the treat before you take the other object. 
So it's give and take, give and take. Your hand going near your dog's mouth should never go in there to pull something out. It should be to give. So give and take. So you want to write that down, give and take. And let's go through um, the steps here. So teaching drop through play. So I'm, have, I'm engaging uh, with Darla and teaching her just a game of tug. She's actually gotten really good at tug. And so I'm just getting her to open her mouth and take the object. Once she has the object in her mouth, so this is what you're going to be doing on Thursday. You want to shake the object a little bit while it's in their mouth so they can get a much harder bite onto the toy. Tug of war is another whole story. We'll talk about that in another time. But tug of war is a great reinforcement for some dogs. It could be the replacement of all treats in some cases, right? Our sporting dogs, dogs that are doing agility, um, don't usually work for food. They work for a game of tug of war. Once you get a game of tug of war going and your dog has a good grip on it, you're going to place a treat or another toy over the nose and wait for the mouth to open and mark that. So here we're playing. I'm making sure that she actually has it in her mouth. You see I have a treat in my left hand. She's got it. So here I, I switched the treat over to my right hand, I think. Okay, here we go. So offering the treat and then removing the object. Give and then take. Now it's going to take many training sessions, but this is a great way to expend some of that puppy energy. So that was a good one. It gets better and better each repetition. So first, engage in play. And then offer a treat over the dog's nose or another toy for a trade. She heard something <laughs> next door. She got a little distracted during the film. All right. Next topic is loose leash walking. We're gonna go through this quick because it's, there's a lot of content here today and I just wanna make sure that we kind of get you out of here on time. Very first step, step in introduction of loose leash walking is understanding where you want them to hang out. Loose leash walking is for a puppy that is not scared of the environment that you're trying to walk them in. So this is not the very first thing you do when you put your dog on leash for the very first time. This is after they've checked out the backyard in the living room and they're okay with it, then they can learn to walk on a loose leash. You have to decide as a family, or at least yourself, what side do I want my dog to walk on? the left or the right. So if you're gonna be going into more formal obedience and things like that, you traditionally walk on the left, but you wanna be able to have your dog walk on either side. Decide whether you're okay with the front or behind. Most small dogs, we recommend a little bit slightly in front because of the random animals, like we have coyotes here, so we don't want the dogs to walk behind us. And the larger, bigger dogs can maybe walk behind us and kind of explore a little bit more. So it's important to have a very clear understanding. And let me tell you why. Because you're going to teach your dog to walk on that side and that hanging out on that one side is the most rewarding thing in the world. And it's really easy. It's three steps. All you're going to do after you have your dog on a harness and leash is you're going to take a, you're going to take a few steps to the end of the leash, whether your dog is watching you or not. You're going to walk to the end of the leash. And if your dog moves, takes one step, you're going to mark. And your job, your goal is to pay your dog exactly where you want them to hang out. So in this case with Darla, she's paying right behind the left calf over and over again. Takes a step to the end of the leash. The dog follows. There's the mark. Click. And she bends over and places the treat right by her left calf, right behind her left knee. That's step one. Um, and step two, you're gonna do this more and more frequently. And the goal is, the third step, is to be able to reward your dog on the go. 
This was her first loose leash walking. This is, yeah, yesterday. This is the very first, first time day. she's ever tried loose leash walking. So you can see the very first step of this is just the loose leash. She doesn't have to look at me. We're in a very distracting environment. I'm not requiring her to heal or anything like that. She's far she's too young. She's really good for her first time. But she's doing exactly what I would like her to do, and I'm reinforcing her in the same spot. Even when she goes around me or goes to the other side, I am consistent, and that treat is always going to be placed in the same spot. Now, two things. If your puppy goes in front of you, we're going to address that. And number two, which someone asked me the other day, is what do you do if the puppy is messing around with the leash? We're going to just talk about that quickly and then we're going to move on. So if your puppy goes out in front of you, don't make a big deal out of it. Do not pull the leash. All you're going to do, write this down, is stop and turn around. There's the stop. And then Julie just simply moves her feet first. Soon as Darla goes, where the heck did you go? Oh, you're going over there. Okay, that foot movement teaches Darla, oh, we're going in the other direction. And then you begin rewarding again where you want your dog to hang out. So she's going to have to increase the amount of repetitions and lower the amount of steps she takes so it's a lot faster. She needs to reward her before she goes out in front of her. So sometimes it's Step, step, click, treat. Step, step, click, treat. Two steps, click, treat. Step, step, click, treat. Now, treating on the go is not easy. You have practice. to keep your feet moving. <laughs> it takes practice. Send me a recording of this because it's hilarious. No, I'm just kidding. Because it's, it is really hard to keep your feet moving. All right. So the last part is, is if your dog messes with their leash, um, if it's the first time putting on a leash outside, don't go over there and help them out. Don't draw attention to the leash. Just get them into obedience mode by offer them a treat, um, say their name or something. They're going to look up and their mouth is going to open and they're going to remove that um, leash. So it's important not to go down and reach because then you make a big deal out of... Um, Nine times out of 10, I see when a puppy is biting on their leash, the owner is pulling. If you're constantly steering your puppy, you're like, come on, let's go. Like they might be trying to tell you something and they're either scared, they don't want to go that way, they haven't explored enough. So if your puppy is actively biting on the leash every time you go out, you need to set up a consultation with us, okay? We had one question. Laura got your question. Um, we have an issue with Billy stealing. Oh, it's really hard to see something around with them. We have learned that our squeaker toy in exchange. Yes, squeaker toys are like the go-to thing. We keep squeaker toys all over the house. Like just put a tennis ball up high kind of everywhere. And now when your dog accidentally gets something, you go, doo, 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 you know, and your dog goes, oh, ooh, you get that. So, but if it's also happening a lot, if your dog is always stealing your stuff, management. Right. You've got to have better management. If they're getting it every single day and doing that same thing every single day, that's something that we need to address with you, not so much the puppy. Right. And if you don't, if you don't understand how that all works, set up a 30 minute. It's a free consultation. We'll go over the steps for you and your family, your household. Yep. Um, a couple of you have already done that with us. Hopefully you think that was pretty helpful. I'm assuming. Instead of a clicker, we have been... Um, I'm going to have to read these once we turn off the right. thing. Yes. Socks. Socks. Yeah. Okay. Socialization checklist. You've got till week 12, maybe 16 to get through this list. So we're going to help you. Younger for smaller dogs, longer for bigger dogs because they grow slowly. So the focus this week is three, three field trips. I want you to go to a playground, a school campus, and parking lot. You can't even go to a children's toy store. Nope. No, no, no. But, Just uh, the parking lot, especially to be around the wheels and different kinds of trucks and cars and motorcycles and scooters and, and all sorts of those And the beach. Things. If you live near the beach, there's right. bicycles, bicycles, skateboards, skateboards roller, roller skates. skates. Yeah. <laughs> We've done this before. Um, oh. Yeah. But just going out, I have so many parents that are so scared to let their, their puppies down on the ground, but an empty parking lot you're probably not coming across a lot of animal uh, waste or 
other things that we would want to keep our puppies away. Remember, exposure is not putting them on the ground. Exposure is, you're going to see in a second how we um, are able to transport the animals without actually putting them down. Some examples of this week's topics, trash cans, strollers, if you already have a baby, right? Or you're planning, planning. you've got all the stuff coming in. Put, have your husband put together that stroller and get the get your puppy immediately exposed to the wheels, tricycles. Um, you're going to see us have, we have a little bouncer that I set up yesterday so the dogs were going underneath. So, um, oh, there he is. Oh, yeah. that's JD. She didn't get magic in this. So this is a little bit of everything, right? You've got moving wheels. You've got the Long Beach, um, what are these things called? Oh, the uh, power scooters. So a couple, couple things to mention. You want to be very generous with your treats when you're exposing your puppies to something new. Tro toss a treat if you need to reset them and look for your puppy's body language. That was loud. That was really loud. Yeah. <laughs> um, kids are next. We're going to kind of talk to you a little bit about it. And then um, if you have any questions, again, just address it in the chat and we're going to get through them at the very end. Sounds. That is the easiest thing that you can expose your puppy to pretty quickly. Sounds that are, you can look up on YouTube are kids laughing, which we're going to do on Thursday. We're going to be playing some, um, some sounds of children crying, laughing, the older teenagers, like talking a little bit louder, the playground, the equipment, things like that. Um, when it comes to puppies and babies, if you're at that point right now, we're gonna want you to just talk to us specifically about your family. Management is key. Babies and puppies should never be left alone. Um, it could lead to a lot of bad things and we're not gonna go in, into details of what it can lead to, but management is gonna be the number one thing that you're using X pens and play pens to keep those, keep it separated. Puppy can smell. So if you've put your, your child just, you know, took off some dirty clothes and has a, um, don't use a diaper, but like a, a burp, one D or oh, yeah. a burp bib or something like that, letting the dog smell and keep it in their little play area yeah. or crate. So in this video, we're just using food to introduce a toy right that a six month six to eight month old baby would be in the moving sounds of something like this can be really scary for a puppy so it's important to expose your puppy to it so that they're not become they don't become fearful of the object or the contraction that you're in and we do the same thing with the little kids right all of those make different sounds and they make different movements so um, examples, making sure that the sounds of even little kid rattles, yelling, crying, screaming, playing, um, having a stroller. If your plan is to have a baby within the next year, go ahead and get a stroller or a toy stroller at a toy store. Start exposing them now. Um, a tricycle, your kids' razor scooters, those powered scooters. If you live in the city, we have those all the time rushing by us. Um, and then children smells. Just and if your puppy is already in the room with you, um, we're going to, in our private clients that have kids, we, we put together a plan and strategically move the puppy or move the dog out of the room. Um, you're already not going to get enough sleep having a child in your room. So right. adding on a dog, the dog's just not going to get a, enough rest and they're going to be very restless and they become more mouthy. Um, so it's important that you strategically um, plan for that. All right, problem prevention. Um, we talk about management quite a bit. Those are muzzles, X-pens, crates, closing the curtains. Those are all management tools. Specifically, we're gonna go over separation, anxiety, and stealing. So separation anxiety is a really serious uh, behavioral characteristic. If you have a dog who is panicking already, who is screaming their head off when left alone, that's a serious issue. Please contact us and set up a consultation as soon as possible. But for those who are still young and we're able to influence that reaction, um, especially under the 12 week range, how separation comes about is your dog is either never left alone, 
they make noises and someone goes, oh, what do you want, buddy? And they usually go and get them out. So they learn that being vocal gets them out of the situation. Um, they don't have their own space in your house. I see that all of the time or lack of enrichment or someone is way too excited when they first come in and then they're, and they, oh baby, yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm only going to be gone for, you know, you're really dramatizing and bringing a lot of attention to the coming and going. So that's how we see the start of this anxiety when they're puppies. And there's three forms of separation anxiety when we're actually diagnosing it. So we're just going to talk about how to prevent it. Preventing it means your dog is okay, doesn't follow you every time you go to the bathroom, right? They don't sit by your door and go, come on, get out. So those, are, those are small signs that your dog has separation anxiety. So to make sure that your dog is not creating um, anxiety, you're going to want to practice leaving the room and giving your dog alone time. If that means that you have to leave and go for a 15 minute walk, you need to do that. The other thing is to set your dog up for success by giving them something to do before you leave. If you always pull out a popsicle out of your freezer, you know, a, a, a frozen Kong that's like stuffed with the Greek yogurt and some pumpkin and a little bit of their food and you give that to them, they're going to be like, oh yeah, bye mom, take care. <laughs> Especially if it's always when you leave. So here is us working, what we call working the room is that your dog sees you leaving and all the way to the point where you disappear, right? You can do this in your home right now, practicing putting your dog in, in a bed or something, giving them something to do and walk through each room of the house and eventually going through the door in, the, in your house, in another room, out of sight, coming back and not not looking at your dog, completely ignoring. So this is us working the room with Miss Pearl. She's a 10 week old rescue that we had a few weeks ago. She is now somewhere. <laughs> All right, so we give uh, Miss Pearl something to do. So this is her little frozen. So something heavy and frozen, so it's hard to take around and follow Yo. So she has to kind of either choose, enjoy my treat or follow her for nothing. So this is how it would work as far as trying to practice this right now. I highly recommend this is something you write down that you do. It's called working the room, small movements away from your dog while they're busy. You ignore your dog when you come back and you give them something to do before you leave. Other than that, you know, eight to 10 minutes of going through different areas. Your goal is to go completely out of sight, maybe even brush your teeth, right? <laughs> and then come back and like, oh wow, she's still there. Not following you to the bathroom. That's the goal. You do wanna look for signs of stress. It might mean that you've gone too far. All right, I hope that's very clear. So work the room. I'll just speed this up. You can see we're going. She's still chomping on that as I walk away. She watches with her eyes, but she is more excited to get and to get through her little puzzle than she is about me leaving. She even, look, you'll see her kind of, where are you going, lady? And then she just completely, you know what? This is way better. I'm just going to hang out here and enjoy this. So she has changed her mind about me leaving right she has a, a pause in there i'm running now i'm actually running in around the house just to kind of make it a little more distracting but anyways i think you guys get the point stealing so i have a little thief in my house i, I don't know about you guys um but i have a puppy who really enjoys my smelly slippers um so when i leave them out or if i you know one night i forget to pick them up pretty sure the next day he's going to find it wherever it is. So um, we want to prevent stealing from becoming a habit because a lot of times when we're reaching towards our dog or we're constantly taking things from them, they learn to guard or be apprehensive about you approaching their That's things yeah. because, well, why would I let you come and touch this if you're just taking it every single time? Um, save your stuff. I have, you know, stories all the time about Lululemon pants being chewed up or my shoes have a hole in them or, 
So save your stuff, prevent costly surgeries. Even a small amount of fluff or a bobby pin can result in thousands of dollars of surgery. So um, make sure your puppy is not scared of your hands because then again, we get this growling or pulling back and trying to hide things from you. So is we want anyone's to puppy growling when they approach. I know once. I or know. showing their teeth yeah. or pulling back and trying to hide things from you. These are things that um, if you're already seeing them, you really need to consult um, either us or another certified trainer because that can turn into something serious. Yeah, never ignore the growl. The growl is not an invitation to try harder. The growl um, specifically means back up. Even if you don't feel a threat, you want your dog to feel like they were heard and you completely understand. Then you can work through the why it's happening and that if you ignore the growl, the growl goes into a more escalated behavior such as showing teeth. They'll start doing this when you approach. Um, you'll see some air biting. Trust me, if a puppy wants to bite you, they're going to bite you. So the air bite is just a little warning. And then it goes into the contact bite. And then it goes up from there. So there's six levels of bite. Don't teach your dog to bite because it's hard to reverse that. And I've had two puppy parents lately say, I don't want my dog to growl because I don't want them to be aggressive when they get older. Growling has nothing to do with aggression. It has everything to do with communication. And if you ignore that communication, there's like 11 steps before you get to that big bite. So just know if you're ignoring one, they're going to skip a step and they're going to get bigger and bigger. So try not to repress that communication. If there's a growl, back up, see what's going on, and then you can address how to properly get things exactly. away from them. So when it comes to teaching your dog not to steal, number one, why are they stealing? Because you put it in their area. That's why they're stealing. It's on the floor. It's yeah. fair game. What did I see? The, I was on the beach and there was something on the floor. And it, I think it was, I don't know what, it was, a sock or something. The dog put the sock in their mouth. And I'm like, well, it doesn't, if there's flip flops, it's free reign, right? Yeah. So if it's on the floor, you can't get upset and get mad. You just have to fix the problem. So you're going to, then we're going to show you, you're going to teach the drop and all of that. But before that, you're going to prevent that from happening. So here's a little video of Cooper. Um, we're showing um, him stealing a slipper. You can talk through it, Julie. Automatic, you know, slippers, shoes, socks, very stinky, usually have some sweat. So our dogs are naturally drawn to them. The moment I take mine off, they smell like you. There goes Cooper. He's snatching it and he's going to walk away. Now, whose fault is it if he gets something in his mouth? Yours, because you left it on the floor. Because I left it on the floor and my puppy is on the floor. So here's the solution. Instead of yelling and going, oh no, you got something. I'm going to calmly walk away. I'm going to go and grab something and make that even better than that boring, stinky shoe, right? Here's an exciting pink toy that you've never played with. So those of you that have tried that, I know I saw in a couple of the comments that you have done the trade. You have to make the new object more interesting. And doing that is looking at the object, shaking it, and making it look like it's a secret, right? Especially if they already know what the object is. Don't show it all of them. Go, oh my gosh, look, oh geez. You know, and then offer it to them. There, there's going to be a brief second where they go, oh, what is it? And that's the moment their mouth opens. And then you can, you can basically remove the other the object that you want to take that they accidentally got into. And then the last step of this is put your stuff away. Manage the environment. If your puppy is out and they're constantly stealing your things, stop leaving your things out for your puppy to steal. Because they're a baby and they don't know better. But you can pick up your things or limit your dog's access to those things. Those are your two options. Pick everything up off the floor or give your dog limited space where they ha only have access to their things. So on Thursday, we're gonna play the trade game again. Puppy picks up something, you are going to offer a trade, whether it's another toy 
or a treat over the nose to get their mouth to open. You're gonna keep practicing this trade game, which is eventually going to teach the drop, right? So we're teaching a take. So that's your pair of socks and a drop. So Darla picked this up so quick. And then we're gonna show you another game that we play to also teach it that's even faster. So here's toy trade. It's over the nose, on top, not down low, and then there's the trade. So she's trading one object for the other. If you go down low, you're probably gonna get that accidental hand bite. So we wanna show it to them up high. Up high, they forget what's even in their mouth. And here's me with that tennis ball has a squeaker, and she's just, you know, she's, happy she's okay with the trade. That's your goal is to be able to offer a trade at any time. Your dog's like, oh, happily. All right, let's go into the walk. So the pet walk, puppy empowerment training walk is the very first type of walk that you want to take your dog through. It teaches them independence. It helps build their confidence and it makes them realize that the world is not that dangerous, right? So by using their nose and exploring new areas, um, they become more confident and less likely to overreact. So our Rowdy Rover class that works specifically with dogs that overreact, they have to do this pretty much 90% of the time to help prevent that overreactive behavior. So we teach this with puppies so that eventually you can give your dog a cue, you know, come here. And your dog listens because they're not afraid of the real world. So again, your dog will not listen to you unless they're safe and they feel comfortable and confident in the, in the environment that you put them in. So you do this first. It's just a sniffing walk. You use a long line, 10 to 15 feet, not one of those stupid things. Flexi, retractable, no. ditch those because they're, they never allow for an opportunity to be loose. Right? If it's always a bungee or pulling back, it's constantly tight. You're going to have a very hard time letting your dog be comfortable on a loose leash if they've only ever practiced with that tight, retractable one. So letting them explore. The leash is loose. You're following. They are leading the way. That's the difference between that walk and a um, loose leash walking. This is a longer line and letting them go sniff everything in the neighborhood. And it gives you the opportunity to watch your puppy and dog's body language, really stepping back and allowing them to explore independently, not saying, hey, mom, is this safe? But feeling like they can go forward and backward and side to side is going to let them approach and discover things on their own so they don't have to constantly be seeking attention when they're outside because they've been there and done that, right? I've already smelled that tree. I like the pet walk to the oh, longer gosh. leash walk for for the kids in your house that are maybe 10 to 16, you know, that don't have the skills to teach the dog to walk right next to them. Um, if we put something together for you on exactly how that, what that looks like, um, would that be helpful? We'll give you like a little more of a video, a five minute video that you can show. Um, that type of walk would be great for, if you've got the kids, you want to get them involved in part of the work. Um, it's no it's pressure. Easy. Yeah. It's really, it's actually kind of boring. So it's nice to take someone else with you because your dog is leading the way. The whole point is for them to find what's enriching to them. So we talk about four different types of methods that we use for training a brand new behavior. We did targeting last week and we've done, um, there's capture shaping. And today we're going to focus on luring. Luring is is, is a very common way. I've seen a lot of people teach their dog how to go into sit by putting food in their fingers and then luring the dog. Um, as a clicker trainer, we typically don't have any food in our hands. We teach the behavior first and then the dog is paid after. But we do, we do know it's a lot faster sometimes to, to, to work with luring. So the goal in luring is to get the behavior going and quickly get rid of the food in your hand. So even when you're luring, so watch my fingers, you typically want to use your middle finger and thumb and keep your pointing finger out so that your dog can eventually just follow the pointing finger. So today we're going to talk about um, 
teaching a down and a rollover, which you're going to do on Thursday, which I'm excited about. I can't wait to see that one. Boston's actually really low. I've taught four different Boston Terriers for rollover, and for some reason, it's just their favorite thing in the world. I think because they're body They're types. like kind of rolly, <laughs> and they like they love being on their back. So this, is, this was such a fun one, and she got it super quickly. So. so here are the target points. You're going to bring the treat about two inches away from your dog's nose, and then you're going to stay about two inches away from their nose the entire time. Time, and your target points are cheekbone, ear, shoulder. So it's nose, cheek, shoulder. You're going to try to follow that line. Now, the direction that you're going to have them roll over is based on how they're laying down. So you first have to get the dog into a down position. So when we teach down, when we're teaching it with luring, we go treat to the nose and we place the treat right between the two paws and we normally push in about an inch. Once you get the behavior happening pretty consistently, get rid of the food and start to quickly put it on cue, which could be a hand cue or just simply saying down, the word that means the action. So Darla, we were actually working on a pout which is a chin down. So she has already a down, but now we're working on her putting her chin all the way down, which is what we do with some of our service animal trainings. Is they, they go all the way down and chin is resting. So it's not just a down. Sometimes we call it a down, down. Yeah, double down. <laughs> okay. So once you have the down, you're going to figure out which side you're going to do rollover. And it's based again on where the dog's hips are positioned. How cute is she though? Yeah. Right. Adorable. She's 11 weeks now? I think she's 11 or 12 weeks, yeah. Okay, so let's fast forward to, okay, here, here we, we go. go. Okay, so I want you to take a look at where her hip is. Her hip, her, um, which hip bone is in. So whichever hip bone is touching the mat and, and putting most of the weight, you're gonna wanna roll, start the roll from the opposite side. Does that make sense? So if I push my hips over here, I'm going to be rolling this way, right? So this no, way. if your hip is there, you're I'm going to be roll. rolling this way. <laughs> you're going to roll them into the ground. So wherever their hip is, you're rolling them over that particular hip that they have. Down. And we're going to help you on Thursday, but here's a few little tutorial videos. We're rotating in towards that drop tip. So the drop tip stays down. There's the so shoulder. there's two inches away. And so she's just getting her to move and rewarding her, paying her right there with the food she has in her hand. Right, don't try to do the whole thing all at once. Yeah, you first want them to feel comfortable. Sometimes they'll flip back around and go, what are you doing with me? Right. But it was really cute. Here's a slow motion of the final flip over. I think it's just the it last like, yeah. leg. Just and then to you quickly bring the your hand all the way down to the floor of the opposite there side to get go. that full roll over and then have some fun with it. Oh, that was awesome. Really good. Right. And look, uh, she went right back down to try again. She's like, okay, let's do that. You do want to use a good soft spot. <laughs> yeah. She rolled off the soft spot several times. So, but you definitely want to protect their spine and their hips by having a cushion on the ground. <laughs> she's like really trying yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's making it look so hard. Yay! And she got I'm it. So excited. So that's it. Takes a while usually to get a rollover, just because it's very unnatural for a dog to just twist like that. But um, once you, but once get they it, do it, yeah. it's so much fun, and Especially they especially your it. expression, like your your puppy can feel like, oh my god, I did it. Okay, <laughs> something I did. So they'll get it especially that big of a movement. Um, and the cue could simply be a hand cue or it can be a verbal. I recommend getting on a verbal really quickly so you're not having to bend over and teach that so many times. All right, here's the flirt pull. So you do want to use a place which has a really good surface. The flirt pull is an extension of teaching drop and take. It's perfect for dogs like Aussies and Terriers that love to chase mm -hmm. squirrels. So here's option one or the very, very intro of flirt pull. You're going to probably get down to your dog's level and just kind of introduce the toy that's attached to a rope. This is the first time she had ever seen it. So she was 
like, well, I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do with it. So um, Julie did end up going down on the floor a few times and getting her interested in the object herself by shaking it and moving it, making it look like a, a squirrel that's moving. And once she got a hold of it, and this is what you know some terriers do, they take it and shake it, right? They've got it in their mouth. Now you're gonna offer that treat for the drop and you're going to get that con continuous cycle of take this, play, drop, and go. So Just like fetch, the point is not to get them to run the big massive mile in a circle. It's just to get them involved first and then we can increase the distance at which that we're playing. So we use flirt poles for a lot of reasons for people that don't have backyards. My dad is 76 and has a puppy. So this is a great way for him to exercise his dog without hurting his back and having to really bend over for the toy. Yeah, if you have mobility issues, you don't have to get down on the ground. You could sit nicely and use this up on a chair. Um, so this is Darla. This is a more advanced version where she's actually waiting for stimulus control of a sit. She's getting that sit and then rewarding her with play. Imagine that you're going to be able to get rid of all of the treats and just work for, for play. So here's Miss Darla going after her. She's got it. She shakes it. Julie just cues a drop from standing. Darla happily lets it out of her mouth and waits for the next turn. So she's added a sit in between repetitions. Perfect. The sit is the behavior she's asking for. The reward is a game of, of fetch, basically on a rope. And let them win, right? They're yeah. a little kid. You wanna make sure that they're, don't, don't just throw it around like a cat toy you would. Um, you, the point is for them to win, to get it in their mouth, and then you start over again. Another one, if the kids are taught how to use this, another great tool for kids to learn and how to teach that because they don't have to put their hands on the puppy and their sharp teeth, right? Absolutely. They can always toss the food and then pick up the toy and wait. So it's called a flirt pole on Amazon. There's a lot of a variety of different ones. There's some that come with like a six pack of different stuffed animals that have squeakers. This is a 10 minute maximum. If for these age puppies, we did about five minutes maximum. You want to avoid overstimulation and too much pressure on the twisting in their joints because it is going in a circle or some of them jump and get overly excited. So try to keep that exercise short so that we don't ramp them up or um, create awkward mobility mm -hmm. issues. Yeah. Um, we have a currently have an enrichment challenge project um, challenge going on. It's just about how to have fun in lockdown. So who, who in this class right now has been participating in our um, fun in lockdown challenge? If you can just raise your hand or just say me. Okay. Yeah. Laura, Karen, right. Matt and Sarah, we are nice. Love it. Awesome. Have you noticed a difference in your dog's um, ability to relax or if you've noticed a difference in um, in anything that like you're, you're not having to go out and exercise as much maybe sometimes a little bit I haven't noticed it yet. Noticed <laughs> that she will be distracted by what we want her to be easier okay. so if like when we had the people here we gave her a Kong and she just instantly went to that instead of get, being nervous Yes. Wonderful. So increasing that confidence and that um, she's learning to be more independent. Yeah. Right? Like we talked about before. So encouraging her to problem solve on her own without parents rushing in and solving it for them. We saw in the videos that people submitted puppies that were afraid of some things, of, of using their nose or their paw, became more and more confident. And I want you to think about that outside. What that helps with is when your dog, your puppy sees a flag, you know, mm -hmm. and they're more, they're going to be more likely to go explore it because they've done enrichment projects versus going, oh, what's that? I love this. I'm going to read a couple of these. Um, we're behind, but it helped. Yes, it helps with my puppies resting. It wears your puppy out without having to run them to death. Um, Sharon said they really look forward to this every day and seem to be more self-reliant and confident. So for those of you that have multiple dogs in the house, 
creating self-reliance. And Lola is less timid when giving new things, so she's more confident. That's what we love to hear from our puppy parents and enrichment. Maddie, have you tried any enrichment projects with your puppy? You can unmute yourself. We've done um, like different like puzzle things. Um, so like a sliding puzzle. That's really nice. There's a canine enrichment Facebook group. I mean, not to mention our page was, I mean, tons of ideas, but hundreds of ideas. you go to that canine enrichment Facebook group, if you're allowed on Facebook, Maddie, um, <laughs> and there's a Pinterest one as well, where you can get a lot of great ideas on how to use household products to create these fun little puzzles. Doesn't have to be expensive. You don't yeah. have to go out and buy, you know, the whole pet store. Find one or two things that your dog really enjoys doing and make your own. Yeah. And the, the purpose of it, there's a lot, but we just want you to make sure that you, if you have any questions about that, you know we have a challenge going on. Today was day five. We have a Zoom party on Thursday. Um, if anyone wants more information in today's link, I'm going to send that to you. But we are... Um, I think I had one more page, but I think it was just mostly an exit page. Oh, no, it actually has the materials for Thursday. So oh, let's okay. share yeah, we that. We want to make sure that you guys have the right things for class on Thursday. Okay. So. All right. So for Thursday's class, um, you're going to want to bring two toys. We're going to be practicing that trade. Um, make sure your dogs haven't played with them or if you, they have, just put them away between now and Thursday and we'll hold off on it. You're going to create an obstacle or you can just bring one object that has wheels. So those of you that have scooters, skateboard, wagon, vacuum cleaner. Bicycles. Yeah. Furniture dollies. When it's time to present those objects, you're going to want to put them on their side and never roll them towards your dog. When we tell you you're ready, you're going to be rolling it away from your puppy and your puppy follows it. Okay. Um, kids backpacks. So if you've got kids that got smelly stuff, go ahead and just bring it with you because we can um, want you to use that as part of your enrichment project or pool blow up stuff. If you have a pool or if you have pool toys, like the water wingies or the that kind of stuff is they're going to see around a lot of kids in bouncy houses. So if you have an inflatable mattress or something like that, that can help with the, the kid project we're going to do. If you have a baby rattler, that's a really good one. We are going to be playing kids playing um, over the mic during one of the enrichment, one of the um, training sessions. So I think the three or four minutes. So be maybe practice that before Thursday. Um, bring a mat so that we can work on the roll over. Um, heavy chew or bone or frozen Kong. Something for your dog to do so that you can listen. Those of you that bolt out and start, <laughs> give them something to chew on while you're, while you're able to absorb the information. And I know you guys know this and I know you want to get to work, but it's important your dog actually takes a break. break. And if you have a flirt pool or you're able to get one, go ahead and bring it on Thursday. Otherwise, just bring a, a couple toys that you'll be able to use. We'd love to that. have some of our clients live demo, or if you're having yeah. trouble with the dropping and trading, we can help you out right then and there. So if you haven't already, take advantage of that 30 minute free puppy consult. Your homework, checking off those wheels and kids items for the socialization list. You're gonna take three field trips this week to a playground, a parking lot, and a school or a campus, depending on what you live near. Um, and they're all empty right now, so letting them smell and get close. See, and just see and smell. Walk through the hallways if it's unlocked. Um, don't break into a school. And then practice the trading game. Not with the two items that you're gonna to bring to class, but practice trading everything, anything, all the time so that your puppy really understands that process of getting something better. We are offering a couple offers. We have an unlimited group class and a puppy hybrid package if anyone is interested. Other than that, our 30-minute coaching session, it's complimentary. It's to review your setup. You take pictures, send it to us, and we're going to give you feedbacks of moving things around. We'll review any of the toys that you have, and we'll kind of go over maybe what to do with them. 
Um, we talk about the puppy schedule um, with our private clients. We actually give them a template where they can change things up and then we'll review your goals and give you a, like an ebook, almost like a little special ebook. Um, let me get out of here here and let's go over to questions so you'll be able to schedule that I'm gonna put our do you want to put the email or phone number in the chat um, schedule the consultation yeah let me just go ahead and give you Julie's phone number stop and the live stream <laughs> what said so stop the live stream so we don't go international with my phone number um, we'll just put it in the Facebook. chat so that everyone can have if you would like to set up um, a free 30 minute consultation with us to get your puppy started, to learn more about training, um, to make sure that you have an ideal setup, go ahead and go to the chat. That is my real number, um, text or leave a message. So I know your name, your puppy's name and age, and then we'll get back to you with, um, times. Okay. So let's go over a few questions. So do we need to have, do you need to teach your dog a down before you go over rollover? Wherever you're at, we're going to work with you from that point. So if your dog already has it down, then you'll be working on rollover. If your dog doesn't have a down, we'll focus on down. If you'd like, starting today, you can work lure, using a lure to teach the down. Um, to do that, it's going to be treat to the nose with your middle finger and thumb on the food is in the middle finger and thumb and this pointing finger is out. You're going to go treat to the nose and you're going to draw it down and in. So if their paws are like this, you're going to go down and in two inches and you hold your fingers on the floor. Now what happens is you're pinching the food. The dog starts nibbling on it and gets into it, but then gets tired of standing. That's it. That's what's happening. And then they just drop down. And the moment that they drop down, you flip your hand over and give them the food. Right? That's it. So you and don't you have to say the name. Say if nothing. they don't know how to do it, we're not naming it yet. We're just going to put it down, wait for that action, mark it, and then you can try again to make it more reliable. So to be clear, middle finger and thumb, treat to the nose, draw a straight line to the floor between their two paws, push in two inches, and hold the food in between your fingers. Puppy starts nibbling on it. Don't do anything. Wait until the hip drops and you'll say something like, if you have a clicker, that's where you're going to hit your clicker when that hip drops. Otherwise, you're going to say a marker like, yes, and then your hand flips over and you let go of the food. Now, just a little bit of a tip. Puppies have sharp teeth, so kids don't do this. <laughs> don't do luring with oh, children. Yeah, yeah, because they... If they're not going fast enough, the puppy will get frustrated yeah. and bite their hand and then they drop that treat. And what did we just teach the puppy? That biting kids gets your treat faster. So we wanna make sure that adults are doing this until you've got it really reliable. And then we can teach kids how to target or use toys, but this is an adult practice first. And then we can always, we will have an upcoming workshop in June about kids and puppies. Um, so stay Specifically tuned. Specifically like for five to 15 to 16 year olds. Right. Maddie, you're good. I think you can, you're fine with teaching uh, yeah. down. We had a question about, okay, Tucker follows us to the bathroom, but once the door closes, he leaves. That's a very, very mild case. That's yeah. not really like um, separation anxiety or signs of it, but it could lead to it, right? Mm -hmm. If they close the door and start scratching or whining or barking, that I would say is you need to address it like separation anxiety. But regardless, I would practice this at least one time between now and Thursday and then make it part of your training plan where you're still, okay, separation anxiety training. You know, I'm going to practice leaving the room because one day, guys, you're going to have to go back to work, right? You're going to have to leave your house for a couple hours. And if, if it's the first time you leave and, you're, and your dog is going, what the heck? Um, it's going to cause a lot of problems and you're going to end up not being able to go back to work full time. So, so Margie, that's a really good question. Do you always have to leave the bed slash crate open for the puppy to go into during the day or just have beds available? So if you're sticking, that's, that's Darla, she's 11 weeks. If you're sticking to that schedule where she's not out for very long, 
That's the time that you're supervising, bonding, training, and then putting her up for a nap. Now you can leave it out and open in the room. And if she wants to kind of go in and out, that's her choice. But I would focus on keeping your puppy up and stimulated and working with them during that 45 minutes that they're awake and concentrating and then putting them back in for a scheduled nap time so that once we've got that over a couple of months, you'll notice that your dog is going, you know what, I think it's, I think it's nap time, I'm gonna go and lay down. And they start putting themselves to bed automatically. Does anyone else have any questions about their specific schedule based on their life, your work schedule, and you're trying to get, you know, work things with the kids and yourself? Um, we are really good at implementing schedules and routines for everyone in the house. So Especially that you with can, puppies, man. So you we can do share. This. Does anyone have um, a question about that? We can actually probably even show you a demonstration live, not right this second, of how we implement a schedule. Um, we did one with for Karen the other day. We went through like step by step. You're going to do this first, and you're going to do this based on what time you wanted to get in your chair and start working. So if you want to work at seven, you're going to do this, 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 right? And then your dog sleeps for this amount of time. And then you go this, this, this. So we can implement a step-by-step -step schedule that you can have and a template that you can change and, and move around. And so Maddie, you're doing this and you know, you're doing this. So you can actually assign different parts of the job, like enrichment is for this one. The pet walk is here. If that helps, we can send you a PDF. If you can't fix the PDF or use it, we can send you a Word document or page document so that you can have it and you can kind of make it your own if you'd like. So put in the chat if, you, if that would help. If we gave you a template, just put in yes, and we'll send that in today's email with you. Umi has a good question just for the very end. Um, should exercise happen before feeding always? Oh. I tend to vary the time of exercise. My dog gets really overly excited, so we exercise afterwards so that she's not um, breathing too fast or sucking in her Different food. Breeds too, Different yeah. breeds, it's going to be important. Some breeds are prone to bloating. So you need to look, you know, be very conscious about that when you're working out before or after food. But every puppy is different, just like every person is different. She loves to work out in the morning. And I'm like, I have to do it after my brain doesn't click on until 2 p.m. So remember so. that there's some breeds that are specifically known for bloat. Right. So if you have a dog that's one of those breeds, you're going to be careful and you're going to do exercise and feeding times at a specific order. Okay. Um, we had a really good question. It was about, mm -hmm. should the dog space be in a social area or kind of out of the way? Great question. I love, I love that question. Um, specifically your dog, your puppy needs a lot of sleep. And if you have a Cameron, you could probably join in on this, but you have a, a child in the middle of a room, they, they cry, they, they don't get that deep quality right. sleep. So same with your puppies. If you can't put your puppy away, close the blinds and create a, a Zen place where there's no distractions, your dog's going to sleep, but they've got like one eye open the whole time. And they go, wait, did they go? Oh, did they go? And they're constantly up and down. Mm -hmm. So it's important to create a quiet space. So we highly recommend not just using the crate that you have in your room for sleeping only at night. Okay. Use that same crate that you're not in your room. You're probably out working in your office. Take your puppy and put him in that space right there. That's a perfect spot. They're sleeping there at night anyways. That's a great spot to have them sleep during the day. Two good strong naps and nighttime sleep. Then the other the other times can be supervised in an X pen in the middle of the room. After four o'clock, you want to keep them awake anyways. That's where the X pen in the living room would come in or keeping them tethered to you. We have music for Darla during her nap. Should it be quiet? It depends on the kind of music. Some music can be really nice and soothing to dogs. Classical music. They make special dog reggae. and puppy reggae music. Is Red, really reggae good. is really soothing. Um, we had a crazy dog in our program that loved uh, Frank Sinatra. Anytime I turned it on, he would just quiet down immediately. So different music, 
Um, you want to stay away from like heavy metal and ska and big, you know, But booms. use music to, to drown out. So if you live in a city like me, it's loud. I have fireworks. I've got, I'm going to turn their music up higher to drown out that noise. Your dog will be fine with the music that you play. And you do want to have sounds going. Otherwise, any little sound that happens, your neighbor's dog starts barking, your dog can't sleep. Mm -hmm. So I would turn the music on. And during fireworks, we talk about drowning out everything, sealing all the, the windows and putting up music. Um, Cameron says, if we leave the crate open, he takes the bed out of the crate. So if that's something that you want your dog not to do, then I would shut the crate door <laughs> and so that the, the bed stays in there. Or provide, he may just want to bring a bed out of his crate so he has a place to relax. You may want to get sound another machine. bed. What's a sound machine? Oh, that's a white noise machine. Oh, a lot oh. of our puppy parents have those as oh. well, the white noise machines. That works great. Or even just a, I live in an apartment and it doesn't have a lot of circulation. So a big box fan can sometimes drown out that extra noise. Cameron, I, I found that she like will wake up if there's like a toilet flush or even if the crate is covered. So we were thinking about getting a white noise machine just to sort of drown out those ambient louder noises. Absolutely. I have the Alexa and we think it was like $69 last Christmas and it plays, it's a speaker, a small little echo. I think it's echo one. And I turn on reggae or acoustic music from here. Like I can just play it right from here. So the sounds, uh, Umi, we want to play sounds during a positive association time. So while you're feeding, if it's going to be fireworks, construction, vacuum, baby crying, we want them to be awake and, and associating <laughs> and eating with that. Don't play that during bedtime when they're alone and trapped and they might panic <laughs> and they're like, what is going Like bombs are going off. Right, we want to be there to be able to watch. Great them. question. That's a really great yeah. question, though. But yes, from day one, start exposing them to noises, just not necessarily during nap time. So two kinds of noises: you've got your reggae and your R and B and your classical and your acoustic music when they're sleeping, and then you've got the other noises when they're awake. You're doing play. You're doing feeding time. You're going to expose them to all the different uh, noises that your dog would need to be, you know, be exposed to. I think that's. That's the questions that we have for now. We are gonna send out that puppy template and schedule in your follow-up email. Just remember that not like one schedule doesn't work for every family and every dog. Your lifestyle really depends or fitting the puppy into your schedule is gonna make sure that you guys are successful and consistent rather than creating an, un I'm gonna wake up at 4 a.m. and walk the puppy and go and exercise, right? Like. Let's get them on a good schedule first so that we can be really consistent and then you can start adding these big goals into your future. Does anyone have any other questions? We will stay here as long as you do. If your dog is a heavy chewer, um, if he tends to rip things up in the crate, I wouldn't leave him alone uh. with the stop. I would leave him with a Kong or one of those rubber- um, Chew bones. Nyla Bones has yeah. a good one, but something that's safe where he can't rip Let's it. put, um, we'll go, we'll put in the Amazon link, a uh, flirt pole, a couple chew, chews that we recommend that are not food. I sent, I sent a couple to, uh, um, God, who did I send them to? I can't remember who I sent it to. I just sent it to someone just recently. Um, I'll send that over in a little link on their stuffed animal. Okay, that was it. All right. All right, guys, so Thursday, are we ready? Any questions on what you're going to bring Thursday? Karen, you guys are gonna make sure both the puppies are, oh my gosh, the kitty yeah. cat. You guys are gonna make sure that both the puppies are awake for class, right? Antlers, I love them. Yeah, yeah, antlers, marrow bones. Bully sticks. Bully sticks. Yeah. Try to limit the amount of, like maybe one bully stick a day. My dog is a, does raw food, so I do the marrow bones too, straight from the butcher. Um, they're actually not that expensive. And the cool thing is once your dog gets through it, you've got a nice little feeder, right? You've got a little round thing that you can stuff with pumpkin, I wash Greek it yogurt. And freeze it and put it in new enrichment toys. Laura, let's see this puppy. Let's see it. Let's see him. 
Oh, oh yes, little Billy. Oh my gosh. I love <laughs> it. She's so cute. Look at it. It's got a big head. Just set, a, <laughs> set up a consultation with us today so that we can go over Billy's schedule and everything. She's, wow. Oh, she's got a sweater on. She, is it cold over there? Yeah. Yes. It's okay. cold. It's cold outside yeah. here after the rain and the wind and everything, but. Awesome. Does anyone have any? You can. Oh, oh, there's a look at the stuff marrow bones. Let me Very hold on. Very nice, Sharon. Let me, I like that. Let me spotlight this. This is really yeah. good. Look at you. Good Did girl. Did you do that before we started the enrichment challenge? Did you already know to do? Oh, yeah. Okay. She's a dog owner. She's like, yeah, we've been doing this for a while. Nice. And if you freeze those, a friend of mine who was doing, um, uh, some helping like fostering direct with from the dog cafe had said oh you can freeze yeah puts food in kongs and stuff and freeze it and I was like oh I never thought of that and the marrow bones and I'm like oh perfect so now I have, of course they have a million marrow bones yep, yep. I do too so I've uh yeah this, this was a project between the morning's project and the class I was busy Love stuffing it. <laughs> oh yeah, I I make a like a ton of them at the beginning of the week. So when I have to jump on work or I have to run out the door, I can grab something to put in their crate, and they're like, "It's popsicle time." Yeah. So those of you, Cameron, you're gonna expose magic to the baby. This is what you have them do when you're you know spending a lot of attention with um with the baby and doing feeding and things like that. You're gonna give magic something super amazing so that he has a positive association with you holding. Um, right, he doesn't get too yeah. Can I, hi, can I ask a question? So he's been really, cause he's so stuck to me a lot. He's, he gets so anxious when the baby's crying, when I'm in a different room, he'll wait outside the door. When she cries, he cries. Is there anything that we can do to kind of ease that Absolutely. anxiety? So Cameron, we're going to need you to step up. Cameron's going to take over all of the fun enrichment projects and you're going to start bonding with uh, magic feedy time so when we get done i'm going to give you a call we're going to set up a private session okay thank all you right. good. okay go good. attend to the baby i can hear her. <laughs> <laughs> all right thanks thanks guys bye, thanks. bye. Thank all right you guys. so much we will see you thursday morning at 11 remember to grab those those homework assignments and if you have any questions or haven't set up your your consultation, please send me a message and we'll get that started. Callie is doing her enrichment project right now. Megan says, thank you. Yes, you guys, thank, thank you, you thank very you. much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. We will see thank you, you so Thursday. Much. All right, Sandy. Thanks, Thanks guys. Bye. Where are you going for the YouTube sounds, babe? Oh. Was that to us? Was babe? that to us, Sarah? Hi. Were you oh. talking to us? You oh, us no, I was asking Matt where he goes on the YouTube. Oh, Sorry, I didn't know I was unmuted. But I wanted to say thank you to Julie so much. We've had Midge on her schedule. Um, it has been challenging because she cries a little bit. Um, but she's been self-soothing within about five to ten minutes. Oh, good. Very good. Um, and so we've been putting her in her crate with the, the curtain crate curtain closed yeah. um, with a Kong and she's seeming to like it. So we did one whole day so far. That's good. Complete. Well, she's only awake for up to an hour. We give her. Awesome. Good. good. And she's especially so, she's so, so young. Yeah. So keep that schedule. The more, pra the more you practice it, the easier it gets. Day one is always a little kind of off and stressful, but the more I you just practice feel bad because I don't want her to dislike the crate like she doesn't really go in there voluntarily yet that's okay. okay Sarah are you doing crate games we put a Kong in the crate with uh stuffed with stuff when it's time to go in the crate I'll send you a video because I still have your follow-up email to do. I'm so sorry that I'm behind. Yeah. Um, but I'll send you a video to the Crate, crate Games video. Yeah. So. You're going to want to like, since that's the number one thing that you're going to want to do, since there's some fear and anxiety around the crate, you're going to now just focus on the Crate Games. In fact, bring the crate on Thursday mm -hmm. and we'll go over that with you. So instead of exposing okay. only wheels, you're going to put that crate in. Yep. A lot of the awards and prizes are going to be fed in the crate. You're going to toss them in there. Okay. 
All right. Yeah. So we'll, um, I'll have you just put uh, together something specific for you. So you feel really comfortable yep. about that. I'll get on that. And too. then I just had one more question. What's the next group class you guys recommend after puppy start? I'll send that to you too. Prep That's school. my follow up. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm it's okay. A couple of days I just behind. wanted to make sure that we're staying consistent with her training and that we You'll are puppy start for, right for a, a while, you know, at least four weeks and then we'll move okay. on to the level one class. You but... can start the other level at any time, but I would still stay in this class because right. it's free and it makes you accountable, right? Like that just for yeah. me, that's what helps me is like, oh my God, I have a class, you know, yeah. and even if it's re repetitive and redundant, you're like, okay, I, at least that one day a week, I'm going to do something for my dog. <laughs> yeah. I don't think, cause we're both educators. I don't think until distance learning nightmare is over that we can do two classes at once. Okay. So yeah. we'll stick with the puppy start and then I'm done in two and a half weeks and Matt's Good. done in that's three perfect. weeks. Well, so, Sarah, let us know if how we're doing, because obviously this you is your expertise. You guys are doing great. This has been like so helpful, and I see her making gains already. I think she's pooping in the house right now. Uh-oh. All right. <laughs> That's not good. Yeah. All so, right. I better go. <laughs> but thank you. It's been great. Awesome. Thank Bye. you very thank much. You guys. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Did you guys see, uh, Sandy wanted to know whether marrow bones, are they gone? Are marrow bones are okay for puppies? I would supervise. It, it depends on how young the puppy is and she how that, mature they are. She has that little golden that's like, how old, Sandy, how old is your golden? I don't think Sandy's on Sandy's here. I don't see her, but. She was on. She, she I think she oh, logged out. The okay. golden doodle so, because they're no, not the golden doodle. She has a golden puppy, that little tiny puppy that's um, that's literally like uh, nine, ten weeks old or twelve weeks old. I mean, I think that I would just be cautious of it because it's got raw food on it. Um, right. Maybe if you strip it down and soak it and get rid of all of the the meat. I'm just more concerned of the puppy's stomach more than. Yeah. I mean, it's a great chew. Okay. Yeah. So if once you can get rid of all of the substance and it's got a bone, then I would be that. That seems to be really okay. fine. Especially because okay. puppies are supposed and it's got to a little bit of give. beat the crap out of each other to make them. Oh my gosh. Teeth. You yeah. know they they like hit really, and so a lot of the puppies don't have playtime right now. So we need something really hard to push those baby teeth out of their mouth. Yeah. So, well, thank God I've got the two giant. Uh, oh yeah, they do it you're for fine. you. <laughs> they 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 have plenty of playtime. <laughs> I love your videos. Too. Yeah. I love how involved you're getting and letting them. Patience is coming out of her shell like so <laughs> much. She, you know, brother's yeah. out of the room and she's like, I got. This. This. I think I can do this at my own speed, and it's it's really nice to see them yeah. growing. It's really helping her a lot. Awesome. <laughs> Appreciate you being here and sharing, and 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 being just, involved. Yeah, being yeah. involved. You're being you're a really good pet parent, and the fact that those are your fosters are <laughs> it's gonna be are really awesome. rough when I have to let them go. If you know of anybody that needs two wonderful dogs, they're really they're really great dogs. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, and we'll see you on Thursday. Bye guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.